You're listening to the Keto for Women show, and I'm your host and nutritionist, Sean Miner. This show is designed to empower women to find their own expression of the keto diet to maximize their health and happiness. Now let's get started with today's episode. First, I want to introduce you all to our newest Keto for Women sponsor, Artisana Organics. You are most likely already familiar with this nut butter brand, and if you're anything like me, you are already obsessed with them. Artisana makes all organic raw nut butters with super clean ingredients, as in their only ingredients are just nuts in their nut butters. That's it. Nothing else. No sweeteners, no weird oils, just nuts. I originally started buying Artisana's nut butters because they were the only brand I could find that was using both organic and raw nuts, two qualities for me that are really important in the nuts that I eat. Most nuts are heavily sprayed with chemicals and pesticides, which is something I personally do my best to stay away from. And I also made the commitment to eating raw nuts whenever possible. This means they have retained all of their nutrient profile and have not been damaged or altered with the process of roasting or heating. With these two things in mind, I gave Artisana a try, and within one bite, I was totally hooked. Their nut butters are smooth, creamy, and delicious. I use the coconut butter regularly as part of my keto-friendly snack options and also as the base for my fat bombs that I use for snacks. And then the cashew butter I save as a dessert for kind of a frosting on my dark chocolate, which you guys just have to try. I guarantee you will love it as much as I do. Artisana is committed to sustainable and fairly treated ingredients, working with both local and global farmers who meet those standards. So right now, Artisana is giving Keto for Women listeners 15% off their first online order using code KETO, the number for women. So that means you all need to go ahead and stock up on all of your favorites and maybe some new things you want to try from Artisana with this online order. So that's 15% off your first order using code KETO, the number for women. That's at artisanaorganics.com. Again, keto, the number four women, 15% off at artisanaorganics.com. All right, Jimmy and Christine Moore, thank you so much for coming on Keto for Women today. Thank you for having us. Hey, what's up, Sean? So excited to have you both. Very fun. The reason I'm most excited is because we're about to have a nutritional therapy nerd out session right now. (laughs) Yeah, baby. (laughs) Because I have to say, when I was reading Real Food Keto, your new book, it was just like the combination of everything that's going on in my head with being so involved in the keto community, but then being so involved in nutritional therapy. It's like everything... It's just my world. So I was really, really excited to talk with you both because... We get to just geek out yeah, and go crazy on all this nutritional therapy stuff. We're okay. very happy to hear you say that because one of the things that we didn't put in the book that we were hoping it would be as far as a resource for people is NTPs. Yeah. That you have clients come to you and I just don't get this keto thing or I don't really understand what you're trying to talk about when you say detoxification. Now you have this resource you can just plop in their lap and say, all right, simmer on this in between sessions with me. And then it'll all make more sense. Yeah, it's a really good teaching tool for sure. Okay, so we'll get into more about that. But first, I want to hear from both of you. We'll go ladies first. Christine, I didn't know everything about your health history until reading Real Food Keto. And geez, you've been through a lot, girl. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, as I was writing it, I'm like, wow, really? Yeah, it's still going. (laughs) Because you kind of lose track as it goes and you forget about stuff. And I I was looking back like, oh my gosh, yeah, definitely a lot. So give everyone a little bit of a synopsis of where you've come from with your health. And I also want to hear and tell everyone more about how you got into keto and then how you got into real food. So two different stories there too. Yeah. So I started out life really just, I was born three months early. And so along with that comes a lot of health challenges. And so at the age of two, my parents noticed that I wasn't focusing in on stuff correctly. So they took me to the eye doctor. Because I was a preemie, the doctors had to give me oxygen to keep me alive. And that process that caused the blood vessels in my left eye to tear the retina 
in my left eye. So I'm blind in my left eye. And the process had started in my right eye. But fortunately, by the time I got off the oxygen, you know, it, it didn't tear the retina in my right eye as well. So I started wearing glasses at age two. I was a little thing. Probably about 10 or 11, I started having some lower back issues, some joint pain. Again, my parents took me to the doctor. Doctors really never found any answers. And at this point, my parents weren't making the connection between diet and the things I was experiencing. In my early teens, I started developing really bad cramps with my menstrual cycle, really bad pain. Again, went to the doctor. They didn't find anything. And it turns out, you know, I had endometriosis, but it wasn't until I was 32 or so that I was actually diagnosed with endometriosis. And then mood disorders started happening in my teens. And again, we still weren't putting the connection between diet and the things that I was dealing with. If you looked at me out on the street, you would think I was healthy because I wasn't carrying extra weight. In fact, I was underweight. She was stick thin when mm-hmm. I met her, Sean, like 90 pounds. I saw that picture in the book. Yeah. So that, that was me. I mean, you would think that I was healthy, but no, everything that I was dealing with was on the inside. Mm-hmm. So I guess when Jimmy started his journey on low carb in 2004, I still wasn't doing it because I didn't see myself having an issue. I wasn't making the connection between what I was eating and the things that I was dealing with. In 2009, I went to the doctor. He ran the labs, the blood work, and my triglycerides came back at 298, which is really high. So I brought my papers back home to Jimmy and he looks at him and he goes, you know what to do. Cause by this time, Jimmy had been doing it for five years. <laughs> and she knew carbohydrate restriction would bring him down, but she was denying that for the longest time. Yes, I was. But at this point, even in 2009, when he said, you know what to do, the only thing that I changed really was I quit eating m M&M, Skittles and Dr. Pepper. Those were the dynamic trio. You loved all mm-hmm. three of those. <laughs> yeah, I did. And so just those three things, I cut those out, and within six weeks, my triglycerides went from 298 to 136. Wow. I was still eating other crap, but just cutting out these three things just made that big of a difference. In 2011, we went through embryo adoption. We had been having trouble having kids for about 16 years at that point. We'd already been through IVF, ICSI. So we went through embryo adoption because we were told that we would not be able to have biological children. And I still wanted the experience of being pregnant. So that's what we did. And at that point, Jimmy had already interviewed several people talking about the importance of eating healthy while you're pregnant. And so Jimmy was even going out getting liver, cutting it up in pill size form, freezing it, and then he would take it out and let me take it. Yeah. Chris Kresser suggested Mm -hmm. we do that. Yeah. I've done that before too. Yep. So we did that and we ended up losing the twins, but still at that point, I was still very serious about eating low carb. I had already started to see some health improvements, which that's what I really needed to see in order for me to keep going. I finally made the connection about diet and my health. And so one monumental thing that happened was four months after I started eating this way, I went to my eye doctor and and up until this point, every year, my eyesight had gradually gotten worse in my right eye. And my dad had told Jimmy that I would be blind by the age of 35. This was when Jimmy asked my dad's permission to marry me. And that's when he said, well, she'll be blind by 35. And Jimmy goes, I don't care. I still uh, love her and I want to marry her. Mm -hmm. So at this point, when I went to the doctor again, my eyesight actually improved. I went the other way. And so we had to spend $1,200 on a pair of glasses going the other way for the first time in my life. And then? And then it's been the same prescription for seven years. Seven years. We haven't had to spend that $1,200. So we got about $10,000 back in the pocket. Yeah. And obviously the doctors were wrong. Yeah. That you would go blind because you were able to actually heal using food. Yeah, exactly. I told her it's to my advantage, Sean, that she can't see very well because I look more and more good looking. (laughs) (laughs) As the years go. (laughs) Yeah, I do still run the risk of going blind in that eye from retinal detachment. I had to have laser surgery on that eye because my retina started to tear from a volleyball accident. 
So I'm still at high risk for a retinal detachment in my right eye, which would make me totally blind. But I'm doing all I can to keep the blood vessels and the blood supply going to that eye. To, you know, I'm doing my best to keep that as healthy as possible to preserve what eyesight I do have. Mm-hmm. And you haven't even talked about your vitamin D deficiency no. or your gallbladder no, being taken so out. Much. Everybody likes my story because it's a weight loss success story and all that. But I think Christine's story is just phenomenal. It really is. And yeah, there's just so many layers to it that then it's like the layers were taken back off as you continue to heal with your diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were finally making the connection between food and our health. And she made the fatal flaw of thinking her thinness equaled her healthfulness. Exactly. If anything else, hopefully that gets people to think, oh my goodness, what might be going on underlying metabolically that I need to be aware of? Mm -hmm. And this is why I hate seeing stuff on social media. I mean, I can get on a rant right here, but, you you know, so many people judge Jimmy for, you know, the way he looks because he's not a certain weight or whatever. But, you know, I would pit his health markers up against most everybody out there. And I guarantee you they would be better. Absolutely. Jimmy's would be better than a lot of people's out there. So you can't judge somebody by the way they look on the outside because I was terribly unhealthy. It's just you couldn't see on the inside what I was dealing with. I'm really hoping that that mentality is starting to change. I hope so too. That there's so many more things to health than just what someone weighs. That's like Mm -hmm. the last thing to even consider. There's so many other things that are more important than that. And I know both of you know that from personal Mm -hmm. experience and I do as well. So Mm -hmm. hopefully the turn is happening. We'll see. I hope so too. So then when did it get to a point where you decided to turn into more of a nutritional therapy approach and get into the class and really start caring about the source of your foods? So I had been interested in going back to school for a little while. I just didn't know for what. I mean, I like geology. I collect rocks and minerals. We have them. We have rocks all over our house, John. (laughs) Please come take some the next time you come visit. I have a meteorite in my collection. So, I mean, that's how much of a fan I am of collecting. And who got you that meteorite? Some sexy man standing next to me. That's a good (laughs) gift. Yeah, it definitely was. It was a surprise. But so, you know, I thought about going back to school for that. But then the NTA approached Jimmy to see if he wanted to go through the program. And Jimmy says, well, I'm just so busy. Yeah, right. I have five podcasts a week, Yeah, four books the next year. No, thanks. Yeah. So Jimmy said, no, but can my wife do it? And then they said, sure. And so he brought it to my attention and I thought about it. And I'm like, well, yeah, this is you know, maybe something that I could do. I've been listening to Jimmy for so long, do what he does. And I figured, well, maybe, you know, adding the education that I got through the NTA with his, you know, that would make us a really good team. And I, at this point, didn't even consider putting it in book form, what I, what I learned. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people in my class came to it trying to figure out their own health issues And that's kind of the reason why I did it as well, because there were still some things that I was struggling with, adrenal fatigue, and I have Hashimoto's. And so I I wanted to try to get these missing pieces, even though my diet was correct, I was still struggling. And going through the nutritional therapy practitioner program just gave me so many pieces of the puzzle. It's almost kind of overwhelming because I you know, it's like, okay, well, maybe this is it. Maybe this is it. So I had so much information going through my head. It's such a great program. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity to have been able to go through it. I think everyone has that same mentality when they're going through it. First of all, most of us go into it because we either are still trying to heal something or find something else about ourselves, but also we want to learn more to help others. And so in that process, everything that you're learning, you're trying on yourself Uh at that point. So as you're going through the class, you're like every week experimenting with something different or thinking it's something different or trying a new supplement. Yep. It's just like you're the guinea pig for that whole nine months of the class. Yeah, I loved it. It, We learned so much. I guess the only regret that I have with going through it, it was just so packed. I mean, I wasn't used to, it had been 20 plus years since I've been in college. And so I was used to the classroom setting. And so being most of it online, we had three in-person training weekends that we had to go travel for. But 
I wish we had more time to actually go over the supplements aspect of it, the lingual neural testing. Mm -hmm. I'm still, you know, trying to figure things out with that, but it should be a two or three year program. There's so much information in there, but you know, I highly recommend anybody interested in nutrition to go through it. Can I tell you though, Sean, as I was hearing her listen to the lectures, not just once, sometimes twice and three times, mm-hmm. I'm hearing prostaglandin this and cholecystokine and that all mm-hmm. through my house. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to kind of sit down and absorb some of this too. So it's powerful information if you can distill it into information that's translatable to the public, which is what we try to do in our book, I was like, why don't I know this stuff? It was pretty shocking. Yeah, it's so true, especially even someone coming to it from like a real food, paleo, keto type world, there's still so much out there that we don't know. And so I think that's why it's so great that you did put it into a book and put it into like a really digestible format. Yeah. So Every we all need to know this stuff, especially if we're trying to take care of our bodies. Yeah. So putting it into a way that's not so much like a course, but you're still getting that information out is so great. Well, yeah. And and so many people don't even stop to think about, okay, especially for somebody that's doing a ketogenic diet, you're consuming all this fat. Well, if your digestion is off, you're not going to be properly digesting and absorbing those fats. So it's not going to do you any good. So that's why... With each client, I either look at their digestion or blood sugar regulation first and foremost, because you get those things in order and everything else, you'll have a better chance of those things falling into place. And to my knowledge, Sean, this is the only book that's kind of put all the principles of nutritional therapy into one book, which was another kind of, shh, don't tell anybody, yeah, it has keto on the front cover, but it's a whole lot of nutritional therapy for people interested in becoming an NTP. And we actually put a call to action at the end of the book of, hey, maybe you got inspired reading this book, go become an NTP. So we're we're hoping it becomes this kind of conduit for bringing more people into nutritional therapy. Yeah, just even as a starting point to get this information and then it does spark interest for sure. It's going to, and there will be hopefully a lot more NTPs out there after they read this book. All mm-hmm. right, Jimmy, we all love your story. We've probably all heard it. I've heard it probably 20 times at least, <laughs> but I love your story so much. So will you tell us your story? Sure. So in 2003, I was a 410 pound man on three prescription medications for high cholesterol, high blood pressure, respiratory issues. And I was pretty much of the mindset at that point, Sean, of diets suck. (laughs) And if I have to go on another low fat diet, I just would rather be happy and fat the rest of my life than miserable and having to eat rabbit food. That was kind of my mentality. So along comes that year, a diet book for Christmas under the Christmas tree (laughs) from Christine's mom. (laughs) So I get this book and I'm like, oh boy, here comes another diet book. Thanks mom. I know I'm fat. It was Dr. Atkins' book and it totally changed everything I thought I knew about nutrition because every book I'd read up to that point was all predicated on calories, lowering fat, exercise, whatever. And this was the first one that said, cut your carbs, eat more fat, eat more healthy proteins, And I'm like, man, this is just like the opposite of everything I've ever heard to be true about a healthy nutrition. I gave it a go, though. I said, what do I have to lose? And so I started January 1st, 2004 and ended up losing 180 pounds. But more importantly, came off of all those prescription medications, never went back on a single one ever again and have basically revolutionized not just my weight and health, but also my career. I now do this professionally as a living, professionally podcasting and and writing books and living the dream, so to speak. So it's pretty cool. Oh, I love it so much. So much success in these stories for both of you. God has been very good to us. Yes. (laughs) All right. So I want to move on. There's a few things within the book that I want to touch on. The first one might get us into a little bit of a rant because, yeah, yeah, because of these (laughs) real food buzzwords. These drive me crazy. When you're at the store, you're walking through the aisles and basically everything now, it could be the most unhealthy food on the planet. But it's all natural. (laughs) Yeah, but they will market it, yes, as all natural or, you know, claim it's organic or something like that. And then people pick it up and eat it thinking they're doing something good for their bodies. And it drives me insane. You know, my favorite one is organic gummy bears. Oh, my. (laughs) I'm like, really? (laughs) It's just marketing crap is what it is. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We've lost touch with what real food is. And we've talked about this on many of the interviews we've done, but isn't it sad you have to put a qualifier in front of the word food by calling it real food. If it's not real food, it's not food. And we talk about this in the book too, that anything that's not real food is actually food like disease agents. Yes. Seen by the body as a toxin, it's lifeless food. Yeah, definitely. I like what you said, Jimmy. (laughs) Then what's the best way for someone who is trying to go real food keto, go that route, but then sees all these packages out there in the stores and everywhere. And it looks like it might be legit. It looks like maybe Mm -hmm. this could pass as Mm -hmm. real food. What are some tips that we can give people to make it so they actually are truly eating real food? So first of all, I want to make a caveat here that this whole diet mentality can get out of hand, I think. So many people are getting discouraged. Sean hates that word, by the way, diet. So she's all about the lifestyle. Yeah. So people online are saying, well, you must do 100% grass-fed, grass-finished beef all the time, organic this, organic that, free-range this. And The goal is to get there, but we understand that not everybody can afford those things. Life happens, and so we encourage people to make the best choices that they can for the situation that they're in, and they will learn that the more that they eat real food, their body's going to get nourished, and they'll end up not being hungry as often, and they'll actually spend less on their grocery bill. So the important thing is to make the best choices you can. Some things that you can do is go to your local farmer's markets if you have access to one. Support your farmers. I mean, that way you can kind of know where your food comes from. A lot of these farmers you know, will tell you if their food has been treated with pesticides or that sort of thing. And so just support your local market and then eat in season is a big thing strawberries are not available well they are available during the winter you want them during the winter but yeah but you know if you were just out in the wild strawberries would not be growing during the winter and so your body is not meant to eat these types of foods year round so another big thing would be eating seasonally read your labels. There are some products that Jimmy and I use, especially when we're traveling. These dropping F-bombs by Love You Foods. They're just packets of nut butters that are easily carried around. And since we do a lot of traveling, we rely on those. Yeah, Sean was in Mallorca, Spain last year, and you were talking about all the things that you had as snacks. And Yeah, yeah. so easy. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're going to eventually have to eat some packaged foods, but there are real food packaged foods now, which is Very nice for those times. Yeah, so read your labels. But my main tip would be get the heck away from the packaged foods to start and Mm -hmm. start with just having things that don't have a label because if it doesn't, then more likely than not, it's probably going to be good for you. Yeah, most of your food should be sitting in the refrigerator. Yes. Not on the cover. Oil in less than a week. (laughs) Yes, exactly, exactly. All right, I want to move on to your health acronym. So I just saw this and adored it. I posted it on Instagram. I adored it so much. So I want to read this. So you have this acronym for health that stands for holistically healed and optimized, exercise the body and mind, absence of disease or sickness, loving yourself and others, trusting God or a higher power, and handling day-to-day stressors. Oh, I just think that is so perfect. You guys did an awesome job with that. <laughs> Thank Jimmy, you. I'm an acronym he fiend. He is. He's, <laughs> he's so amazing how he just, because we were looking at all the definitions of health and we're like, okay, well, yeah, that's okay. That one's hard to understand. This one's a little bit easier, but we wanted to make it very clear that health is not just about your diet. It's not about the food you eat. It's about exercise. It's about you being grateful for your food. It's about stresslessness. Yeah. It's about Mm -hmm. having faith in whatever you have faith in. Yeah. And stress is a big thing because we can't avoid stress today. So and loving yourself. That was a big thing we wanted to get in there. Yeah. Yes. It's so awesome. So question for each of you, Mm -hmm. which one of these are you currently working on the most? For me, 
it's a toss up between loving myself and handling day to day stressors. Cause I think sometimes I can be very hard on myself and mm-hmm. I'm a perfectionist. Sometimes. Yeah, I know <laughs> I'm a perfectionist. And so if, if I end up doing something that I don't necessarily get the result that I want, I feel like I'm a failure. So I think out of all it's those, okay that it's you married me. Of- <laughs> it's okay. That wasn't, that wasn't a mistake. Oh, no. So it would be those two, loving yourself and handling day-to-day stressors. Oh, mine by far, Sean, is the last one, handling the day-to-day yeah. stressors. I know that's why I still have abdominal fat, and we're actually working on a lot of different things. I'm doing infrared sauna therapy. I'm doing cold therapy. We're actually planning in 2020 to take six months completely off. Wow offline. I'm just going to detach for six months. It's going to be fascinating to see what happens to the belly fat during that time that I'm chilling. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed any change, Jimmy, in your stress levels by doing some of this more like biohacking, quote unquote, type stuff? Yes, for sure. And I would say that it's a lot of built up over the years kind of stress. So it's kind of taking a little while to unravel. But yes, all of those things, a little bit of hit training in there as well. I've got to get back consistently to that again. But all of those things add up. And especially for someone like myself, who's very insulin resistant, those of us that are in this position, we have to work that much harder. And I don't think people appreciate just how hard you have to work just to kind of get to a level of normality that everybody else seems to come easy for them. Mm -hmm, Exactly. Yeah. I think the two that you both pointed out are probably the hardest ones for most people, Mm -hmm. I would think. And it really is important to understand that without those two, without the loving yourself and without some sort of stress management, then you are missing full health. Like the L and the H are gone. (laughs) And neither one of them have to do with your diet. Exactly. I mean, really not very much of this at all has to do with diet. Of course, it's part of the grand scheme of everything that needs to be done holistically, but there's so much more to it. And that's what we all, I think, continue to preach and hopefully get across to all of our listeners. Yeah. All right, let's move on. So one thing that I don't think is talked very much about, or at least in my opinion, not enough about in the keto community in particular is the importance of water. Yeah. Like just drinking water will cure so many things that you have going on for you. Yeah. I like that, Jimmy. It it does. I mean, (laughs) even myself, you know, I'll get out in the garden and do some work and I forget to drink and I'll, I'll start developing a headache or lower back pain. Jimmy will have to come out there with a water bottle. You need to drink, you know, Mm -hmm. so there are early signs and later signs of, dehydration. And a lot of these things we go to the doctor for, so like fatigue, anxiety, irritability, depression, constipation, cravings, migraines. Yeah. Cramps and later signs. Yeah. The migraines, fibromyalgia, joint pain, back pain, colitis, heart problems or heart palpitations. So, and the over 10%, you could die. That was the one that shocked me. I'm like, whoa, that's not very much dehydration to die. But all of these things, you know, a lot of people go to the doctor for fatigue or they go for anxiety. They go for other things and the doctor prescribes them a pill when maybe it's just simple dehydration. I mean, we are constantly losing fluid out of our body, even when we sleep through our breath. So proper hydration is needed for a healthy immune system, for your detoxification pathways, for blood flow, for so many things, digestion. And if you're dehydrated, then it's going to mess things up. Yeah. And it's so easy to do so, especially with the amount of coffee and Mm. caffeinated teas and sodas, you know, even if it's diet soda, something like that, those still all play a role in our dehydration too, right? Absolutely. If you have an eight ounce, let's just say a diet soda, eight ounces of diet soda, that's going to pull out eight to 12 ounces of fluid from your body. So you find, you know, if you're drinking coffee or a diet soda or things like that, you need to go to the bathroom more often. Well, that's what's going on. And so you definitely need to make sure that if you're going to have a diuretic, then to maybe add a little bit of extra water. You still don't want to go over one gallon of water in a day because you'll develop electrolyte imbalances. But this shows you the importance of needing to make sure that water is first and foremost 
what you should be drinking. Well, and especially for a keto dieter, especially in the early days, they don't realize they're dumping water Mm -hmm. when they're shifting from being a sugar burner to a fat burner. And so it's even that much more critical for a ketogenic dieter to get adequate water intake. So what tips do you guys have if people are like, oh, but I hate drinking water? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So early on, I was telling clients to maybe, okay, well, if you want something else besides plain water, do the LaCroix. But now, you know, I'm kind of even staying away from the carbonated waters because they can interfere with your body's ability to digest and absorb calcium. So what Jimmy and I do, we have a big water dispenser on our cabinet, especially during the summertime, we'll do this. We'll fill it up and then we'll cut up some fresh fruit and uh, like strawberries or lemons or even cucumbers sometimes, blueberries, and it kind of gives the water, you know, a little flavor. So if you get tired of plain water, you can do that. Mm -hmm. And the important thing to remember about water is you shouldn't chug it. I sometimes have a bad habit of doing that, especially in the morning when I'm very thirsty. And here's another thing, by the time you're thirsty, you feel thirst, you're already dehydrated. So you got something, Jimmy? Well, I was just going to say in the book, we developed this quarter hour solution. So keep some water by you at all times. And then every time it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or 60 minutes, just take a little sip. And if you do that all day, you get kind of spaced out water consumption Mm -hmm. and you don't even come close to getting a gallon in. Right. And you won't develop an electrolyte imbalance. So yeah, definitely sipping throughout the day. I even keep a water bottle by me while I'm sleeping. Like a freaking teddy bear you do. (laughs) (laughs) When I wake up, I'll just take a sip and just that just make sure that, you know, I'm staying hydrated. We're going to create a new product. It's going to look like a teddy bear. It's actually going to be a water (laughs) bottle. (laughs) You sleep with your teddy bear. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So yeah, those are the things that we do. What's your equation for water consumption per person just so they get a good baseline of where they should be? So I tell my clients to take their weight, divide by two, and that's the amount of ounces of water that they should have in a day, but not to exceed one gallon. Obviously, the diuretics throw a little monkey wrench into that. So you would have to take, in, like, let's just say, again, eight ounces of a diuretic. You would need to drink 12 ounces of water to kind of combat that. But again, not all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, perfect. Sounds great. I think everybody can do that. It's just there's a mindset shift that needs to be made that water is really important and will really do a lot of great things for Mm -hmm. how you are feeling on a day-to-day basis as Mm -hmm. long as you're drinking enough and not too much. Yes. All right. So lots of talk in the book, which I loved about the importance of vitamins and minerals, which again, not something that's talked about very much in the keto community, but needs to be. Not at all, actually. And that that was one of the reasons we wanted to get this in here hot and heavy. But it's a big part of the NTA, right? Huge. Yeah, huge part. And it should be, right? I mean, very important for our overall health. So let's talk about some of this stuff. What are some of the biggest benefits to getting enough minerals in your day-to-day life? So a big one for me, I've noticed if I am deficient in magnesium, I will start to develop heart palpitations. So calcium is responsible for the contraction and relaxation of muscles, but it's the magnesium that makes the calcium work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So heart health is necessary for proper mineral intakes. Communications with cells depend on the electrolytes, which are sodium, chloride, magnesium. (laughs) Thank you. I'm, I'm having a Brain fart. Can I say that? <laughs> Brain fart. You Pota- just did. Potassium chloride. Yeah, sodium. So these these are the big ones that help your cells to communicate with each other. And you need minerals for your endocrine system. So each organ of the endocrine system has a mineral that it heavily relies on. And so if you're not getting these minerals in, your endocrine system is probably going to be compromised. Again, let's see, zinc is is good for the immune system. And so if you're deficient in zinc, you're probably going to get sick often. And a lot of people are deficient in zinc, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, definitely. And, and another sign of this is 
you know, if somebody has digestive issues, because zinc is one of the things that's needed for stomach acid production. Along with? Along with B6 and gastrin. So definitely these minerals just play an important role in every aspect of the body. People just don't realize it. So what are some of those signs? So it would seem then like if you are having digestive issues and you're trying all the things digestively and things still aren't going well, then maybe you do need to look further into your mineral supply. Yeah, absolutely. So again, the the big one, if you are deficient in magnesium, you're going to have heart palpitations, muscle cramps, then zinc, obviously your wounds are going to have slower time healing. You're going to get sick often. You're not going to digest foods properly. I'm having another brain fart here. (laughs) Lithium, this is one of the, you know, ones that's not talked about a lot, but lithium actually, if you are having mood disorders and things like that, oftentimes the prescription that a doctor will write contains lithium in it because it's used to help stabilize mood. Germanium is another one that's good for the immune system. So you might be fatigued. I mean, there's any number of things that you can deal with. And we do a great job. We're very thorough in the book about talking about these deficiencies of some of these vitamins and minerals. Yeah. I think just even looking at this book, people would probably have a good idea, at least to start, what could be going on, what imbalances could be happening when they start recognizing some of these symptoms in themselves. Mm -hmm. And it can seemingly be overwhelming. Oh my gosh, I have all these deficiencies. What do I do about it? And we try to show, here's the real whole foods that you can add. And sometimes it's just like three or four different foods that contain a multiplicity of all of these things that then you get sufficiency in all of those ones you might be deficient in. Yeah, yeah I mean, exactly. If you're eggs, especially, I was going to say eggs and your green leafy your organ, vegetables. green leafy vegetables and organ meats. We tend to kind of shy away from those things. Jimmy and I actually take a is with desiccated. It's a various organ complex yes. from mm-hmm. Paleo Valley, I believe, is the company. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I don't like the taste of heart or liver. Nobody or does. No, <laughs> no, I definitely I will, don't. I will take that, and that really helps get a lot of the micronutrition in there. Yeah, I call organ meats the like nature's multivitamin. Yes. Yeah, it really is. Speaking of vitamins, I kind of want to have the same discussion around vitamins. So the importance, obviously, I think pe- most people have an idea that they need to get a good amount of vitamins, but I don't think people actually understand what deficiencies could be taking place in their bodies. Well, and especially low-fat dieters, they're not understanding A, D, E, and K being so critical to health. And if you're not eating fat in your diet, how are you absorbing those? So that that was the big take home for me hearing Christine talk about vitamins. Yeah. If you're having trouble digesting your food, you're not going to be absorbing those. And if you're not eating enough fat, you're not going to be able to absorb those fat-soluble vitamins. I was going to say vitamin D needs cholesterol to convert in the body. But vitamin A deficiency, Jimmy has a hard time distinguishing between the colors purple and blue. I'm colorblind. And so that's a sign of vitamin A deficiency because the cones in your eyes, which are the things that recognize color, those depend on vitamin A. So what do I need to be eating? More liver? More liver, more Uh, leafy greens. Yes, all the liver. I can do leafy greens, but no. (laughs) How about a liver salad? Yeah. Liver salad, gross. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> so, Although, have you guys tried the U.S. Wellness Brown Schwager and Liverwurst? I have not. Oh, no, you guys should try it. So it took a little bit of getting used to, but it's not bad at all. I cannot do any organ meats, and I can eat that stuff if you put some other stuff on it, like mustard, mayo, that kind of thing. If you cover it up in yeah. condiments, <laughs> <laughs> but it kind of tastes like sausage, so it's not bad. Yeah, well, you should try it. We'll have to try that. Yeah. Another thing that I found interesting, you know, your B vitamins are very important for mental health, but also this kind of little tidbit, I didn't realize this, that B1, so if you're if you're on a ketogenic diet and we've heard other people who eat a ketogenic diet, they say that they don't suffer from insect bites as much. So what's going on there, I believe is that the way B1 is excreted from the body through the skin, it's insects can smell that and it's a natural insect repellent. So, and I've found that personally that 
since going keto, I don't suffer from as many mosquito bites as I used to. So cool, right? Ow. <laughs> I had to kill one on my arm, sorry. Such cool stuff. Yeah. So then people listening might be thinking then, okay, I'm just going to go to the store, get a multivitamin, get all these minerals and just start taking a ton of supplements. Is that yeah. what you recommend? You no. missed the point no. of our book if yeah. you did. <laughs> so some of these minerals, especially one, your fat soluble vitamins too, I recommend each client that I see to go to their doctor and have their doctor run a vitamin and mineral test to see where exactly they stand on their vitamins and minerals because too much potassium is as bad as too little potassium. Both can be fatal. So if you don't know where you stand on these vitamins and minerals, then you might end up doing yourself harm. Zinc and copper use the same pathway. So if you get too much zinc, you're going to be deficient in copper and the adrenal glands depend on copper. So it's important first and foremost to get your vitamins and minerals through real food. And the body's adaptable, right? Yes. So if you get too high in one, it can shift, but you don't want to make your body have to work that hard. Exactly. So get your micronutrients first and foremost through real whole food. But then there are certain situations where Jimmy and I need to supplement me. For example, I need to supplement with vitamin D3 because my body just doesn't do a good job at converting it. And that's part of the reason why I was having some mood disorders. Doctors like to have vitamin D between 40 and 60, I think. And mine was nine when I was tested a while back. And she was on Paxil, which is a anti panic attack medication for a decade, Sean. Wow. And we got her vitamin D in line and all of that need for that Paxil just suddenly went away. Gee, imagine that. <laughs> I know, go figure. Oh my gosh. That is so cool. Yeah. So that's in one situation. I have the MTHFR gene mutation. What'd you call me? Methylenyl tetrahydrofolate <laughs> reductase. We had to do the audio book for the, for the and so love that she stumbled over that. So she's got it nailed down. <laughs> I got it nailed down. So my body cannot convert vitamin B9 folic acid into folate. So I have to take either an additional methylated folate if it, my multivitamin doesn't have it in there, or we try to find a multivitamin that does have the methylated folate in there. And there are a couple out there. You just have to look. So in that regard, I supplement. And then zinc I supplement with because I know that I'm not producing enough stomach acid and that's I was getting sick often. And so if you know that you're struggling in a certain area or a couple of areas, it may be a good idea to do some additional supplementation, but we don't recommend that that's what you rely on to get your micronutrients. So much can be gotten from food. Yes. <laughs> yep. All right. Another question for both of you. I'd like to get both of your takes. Jimmy, just being in this industry for as long as you have, in this community for as long as you have, I'm curious what you think about... What's going to happen to keto in the future? I feel like we're kind of at this point where everyone and their mom's doing keto right now. Yes. <laughs> so what happens now in your opinion? You know where I see this going. I, there's so many people getting in this and I rant about this pretty often because people, I'm so confused. There's so many people talking about keto now. And I say, you know what, who was talking about keto and low carb and kind of the benefits of this long before the trend of keto came along? Mm hmm those are the people that I think you really need to gravitate to. Now, that's not to say there's not new ones that have come out that are doing really, you know, good job. Maybe they were inspired reading Keto Clarity or some other book to get keto. But I'm concerned, actually, that there's so many voices out there that people are getting confused, which is why people like you and me, Sean, who've been out there a very long time talking about this stuff, we have to be that purveyor of really good information that's been vetted by the science and spreading that to our people. And you just hope that the truth prevails in the end because people will try all those other things where they make you buy a supplement for this or make you buy foods for that to do their version of keto. And you just hope they don't get too confused with all the mixed messages that seemingly are out there. I know it's really too bad that there's just an overwhelming amount of information and it's kind of dampening down the true healing benefits of a really powerful diet. But when the keto trend goes away, guess who's going to still be here? Sean freaking minor and Jimmy <laughs> Moore. So true. Now Christine Moore. 
<laughs> yeah, so true. Christine, what do you think? I think that, well, hopefully, my hope is that this will become more mainstream, that doctors will kind of latch onto it a little bit more. And I know with that, they need to be educated in the micronutrition and Mm -hmm. a lot of doctors just don't know. So I think what's happening now is that the market is saturated with keto books out there and what I want people to- And products. And products. But what I want people to know, especially about our book, it's not just another keto book because we do talk about other aspects of why someone may be having trouble losing weight or having health issues. So I totally agree with what Jimmy said to find somebody that you can trust that's been out there a while. And then oftentimes, like Jimmy said, these new people come along. Oftentimes they will be inspired by somebody that has been out there a long time and and you can trust those people. I think the next big thing within the next several years, we're going to be hearing about gut health will be the next big thing. Yeah, I concur. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. There's just so much that we don't know about that. And and our gut health is so important. I mean, 60% of our immune system is in the gut. 90% of serotonin production is in the gut. So if you have poor gut health, then you're going to have digestive issues and mood disorders. But what I think will also need to happen too, Sean, is the fear of fat has to go away. And that's kind of what has held people back for Mm -hmm. so long and getting healthy is they just haven't embraced fat. And so I'm hoping and I'm optimistic. (laughs) I'm optimally optimistic. (laughs) I am optimal, just not in brain health right now. So uh, (laughs) I'm optimistic that people will finally get over the fear of fat. It feels like we've been talking about that for almost a decade, I know, but it just takes so long for the general public to get that, I guess, propaganda that's been in their head their whole lives out of their head. I guess the old guard will have to die off and the new guard goes, oh yeah, we don't think fat's bad. Because you ask millennials, they're not scared of fat. No. Yeah. It's definitely not that. It's this sticky subject that has just cannot lose hold. It just is really still in the minds of so many people just from years and years and years ago. But yeah. I really do think that that's changing quite a bit. And keto has helped with that. Finally. So much. Yes. But okay. Well, what else do we need to share about this book? We need to let people know where they can find you all, where they can find the book. Is in Costco now, right? We have an audio book. Yeah, it's going into Costco Black Friday week. So we're real excited about nice. that. But we have an audio book that's coming out very soon. We're in our recording studio right now. And I've done five audio books before. And so I was like, Chris, you want to join me in the in the <laughs> studio? And she's like, yeah, sure. Like reading a book, that's easy. Was it easy, Chris? No, Uh, (laughs) no, no. that was really, really not easy. (laughs) No, I did not realize. I mean, you would be sitting there, you know, reading the book and then my brain just adds in another word that's not there or it takes away a word. And I'm behind her going, nope. Yeah. (laughs) Read it again. (laughs) Oh, that sounds daunting. Yes. And we do a podcast together too called the Nutritional Pearls Podcast where we articulate a lot of the principles of nutritional therapy, but in kind of a casual manner, just jibber jabber and husband, wife, we have a good time, right, Chris? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There is a website for the book where people can go to order realfoodketo.com. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And my, my website, rebootingyournutrition.com. Yeah. She's going to start seeing more and more clients in 2019. So yeah, 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 yeah. And then I'm at liveinlavitalowcarb.com. Love it. And we'll make sure to include all those in the show notes so you can easily get to those. Thank you both so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having us. It was a pleasure talking to you. Sean, you're a legend. Thank you so much. Really, really fun. And hopefully we get to do it again soon. Absolutely. We better. Maybe in person. How about in person? That would be better. We better. We'd love at the NTA conference. We could do it. Oh, that would be fun. That sounds great. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.